of the Mason Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan. This is episode 150, covering the week of December 10th through December 14th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And, of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. Go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. You can give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook, and you'll get on our email list. You'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, download our free application for your mobile device. Uh, you can go to Google Play, uh, iTunes, anywhere you get your app or the, the Apple App Store and get our mobile application. Again, free of charge, and you can get this podcast on the go along with all of our lectures. There are over, uh, I think right now, there are close to 400 audio files on our mobile app. So you can get all that, listen to it in your car, and have uh, the Abbeville Institute wherever you go. You also get access, mobile access to the website. So it is a great way to keep in touch with the Institute. Again, it is free of charge, so you want to do that. Also, Christmas is coming up, so uh, you've got your Abbeville Institute apparel. Not much time left. Not sure if you can even get that in before Christmas, but uh, you might want to go out to our web page. At the top of the page, you'll see a section that says Support. Click on that, and you've got a Shop button. You can get our Abbeville Institute fleece, golf shirts, T-shirts, hats, all kinds of cool stuff. It is embroidered. It's not screen printed, so this is high-quality stuff that will last a long time in a multitude of colors. So you can get the Abbeville Institute gift for your family member or loved one this holiday season. Even if it comes after Christmas, you can say, look, I got this for you, but it'll be here after Christmas. Also, don't forget, we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you do like what we do, if you do like the podcast, the website, the conferences, all the things, the lectures, all the things that we do, and we have some really, I think, interesting stuff coming up for 2019, you're going to want to support the Abbeville Institute, and uh, that is tax deductible to the full extent of the law. So 2018 is quickly winding down. We've got about two weeks left in the year. If you're looking to make your tax preparations, go on to our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. Again, where it says support, there is a donations for individuals or donor options, I think it says. Click on that. You can donate monthly or annually. Uh, you can donate through PayPal or Stripe by a credit card, or you can send us a check. However you'd like to get in touch with us, we have our address there. You can send us money. However you'd like to do it, we will gladly accept it. And your donations do go to help students and, of course, the public at large in our promotion to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. All that said, let's talk about what we've got going on the week. This is the next to last week of 2018 for the Institute. The next podcast after this one will be the last podcast of 2018. So we've got two left, episode 150 and then episode 151. It's hard to believe we've done 150 of these things. That's three years worth of podcasting. Uh, we started about three years ago now, and we do about 50 a year. So here we are. Well, we, we covered all of 16, all of 17, and now all of 18 of course, the website's been around uh, in this modern form since 2014. So we're rapidly coming up next year on our five-year anniversary of the revamped website. We've got uh, well over 1,100 articles out there. I mean, we're so much stuff. Actually, close to 1,500 when you count all the review articles and Clyde Wilson Library. So much stuff. This is why you should support the Institute. And I've got a, we'll have a piece next week on that, a couple, about what we do. But the theme of this week certainly is history. And we've done this recently. We've talked about why history is important, why we should study history, and uh, how history is distorted, and all these things. But one of the pieces we ran this week, I want to start with the Tuesday piece uh, by Stephen Klugwitz, which um, is not unique to the Institute. This was actually published originally at the Imaginative Conservative. If you don't go to that website, imaginativeconservative.org, uh, I believe. Um, and so... Maybe it's .com. Is it imaginative conservative? Let me let me click on the thing here so I can tell you if it's org or com. Uh, it is imaginativeconservative.org. Yeah. So um, going out there, imaginative conservative. Great, great website. 
And uh, Dr. Pluvitz is one of the uh, editors there, and so you, you want to read his stuff. He does a fantastic job, but he was one of Forrest McDonald's students. And Forrest McDonald, of course, died just uh, not long ago, a little over a year ago. And uh, we lost one of the great treasures in the historical profession. And why he was a great treasure is important. There used to be a time that not all major establishment historians, and Forrest MacDonald was one of the most respected and well-known historians in the United States, if not the world. He was, along with Gordon Wood, uh, considered to be, and of course there's a few others, Bernard Balin, and, but he was considered to be one of the top five historians on the American founding period. And he loved the South. Uh, now, he was a Hamiltonian. He wasn't a Jeffersonian. He was a Hamiltonian, but he loved the South and he admired the South. Uh, he f had a lot of respect from people like Clyde Wilson and uh, Mel Bradford and others. Um, and he was just a great historian. And one of the things that always struck me about MacDonald and what he did, he didn't read a whole lot of the secondary material. He would have his wife do that. And he would read all the primary documents. And he would have his wife condense down the, the, the few books that he should know and uh, he would know them. He would know those books. But he spent most of his time in archives doing primary research, which is what the job of his historian actually is. And he had a, a really interesting, and, and uh, Stephen points this out in this particular piece, um, he wanted to make history readable. And so he says, uh, he says this, quote, resolved to make his Eplorbus Unum re more readable, MacDonald made sure that this Time phases two and three of his craft involved what are referred to as intuition or imagination. Some may protest that imagination has no place in the historian's work, that objectivity is the historian's goal. MacDonald, however, believes that history by its very nature entails artifice. The historian is not simply a mere recorder or reporter of events, but also, like the author of literature or the filmmaker, an artist. In his preference to Eplorbus Unum, MacDonald dismisses the idea of objective history holding that the business of writing history is this, at the same time both subjective and true. Quote, So believing I have written a book which is un, unabashedly subjective, it is myself, through the course of more than 20,000 hours of conscious work and several times that in unconscious work, I have taken in a 100,000 or so scraps of information and attempted here not to reproduce them but to tell you what they mean. Yet I believe that what I tell you is not only objectively true but also objectively verifiable. So he is telling the story. He is telling the story through the primary material, but he's letting it speak for itself. It's objective and subjective at the same time. What the historian chooses to write about is completely subjective. This is why people are, are turned off to modern history, because what historians are choosing to write about is frankly awful. They see history in a way that most people don't agree with. Number one, everything is race, class, or gender. It's all conflict. And America is... It is is undeniably, in their mind, a bad place. It's an idealistic type of history where everything in the past is bad, everything traditional is bad, and we're going to tear all that down. It's all awful. The only thing that's ever been good is what exists between my two ears. And because I say these things are good or these things are all bad, uh, nobody wants to read that. Nobody wants to be depressed all the time. And, uh, and by reading history in this type of way, this is all you're going to get. You get a bunch of depression, uh, anxiety, hatred, spite. This is what that produces. And so when you look at history in that way, and MacDonald did not, his history was objective and subjective, was also optimistic and realistic. He wrote great histories. I think his book on Thomas Jefferson, Je the Jefferson Presidency, is a fantastic book, even though he was not a Jeffersonian. Even though he was a Hamiltonian, he wrote a very fair book of Tom, about Thomas Jefferson's presidency. One of the best. One of the best. Uh, and so MacDonald is someone to be reckoned with. And uh, a, a, just as a, as a real pro, one of the best. One of the best. Is, and he, he loved students. He loved talking to students. He loved helping students. He loved bringing people into the profession. And he wanted to make readable history is also a problem. You read all this pedantic history, these monographs that are so boring. They're awful. Frankly, awful. Historians, and this is where Shelby Foote uh, implored historians to learn how to write. Uh, and 
just uh, last week at the Institute, we talked about uh, Richard Brookheiser's biography on John Marshall. Brookheiser, I don't agree with Brookheiser on a lot of things, but he's a very good writer. You read his histories, and they're fun to read. Uh, historians could learn something from that. Brookheiser, of course, is a journalist by trade, but he knows how to write. And so people are going to read it, and they're going to think, yeah, this is good stuff. This is what Shelby Foote did. He knew how to write. You read a book that nobody wants to read, and nobody's going to read it. It doesn't matter what your subject is and how fascinating you think it is. If you can't put together a paragraph that is enjoyable and and something that people are going to get into and be able to read, you're, that's, that's the job of the historian. The job of the historian is to tell people about history. And so oftentimes people like me who write popular histories are panned by the academics. But some of that has to be, I think some of that is jealousy. Uh, when I can write a popular history that reaches tens of thousands of people, and they write a history that reaches a few hundred people, what are you actually doing? What is, you're not doing anything except scratching your own back and saying, look what I can do. I can produce a book, and then I can get a job, and I can go to these conferences with people that are just like me, and we can talk about the stuff that nobody cares about. That nobody cares about. McDonald was not that guy. He wrote academic books, but he also wrote books that people could read. And that's important. And so that said, we've got a couple of things that have to deal with that within culture and this perception of the South. There was actually a, a, a listener of this podcast who said on social media that he wasn't aware that uh, Southerners were a victim in American society. Uh, this is something that essentially I'm fabricating and that the Abbeville Institute is fabricating, that there's no real Southern victimhood. Uh, I find that very curious, and he said people don't think in sectional terms. They uh, they do every day of the week. Every time the South is brought up, every time the South is discussed, it's always with a perception of what the South is, real or imagined. It's always a perception of what the South is. The South, there's there's no, there's, there's a reason there are Southern Studies programs across the United States in every major university. There's a Southern Studies program. Because... The South is the specimen that needs to be studied. The Southern people are a specimen that need to be studied. And they're the deplorables. These are the people that don't fit within American society. And it's been this way for a long time. But what people don't realize is that so much of what is American is actually Southern. And so many of our heroes, outside of military heroes or political heroes, how many of those people are actually Southern? How many of these people that are uh, engaging in pop culture and other things are actually Southern? There's, and it's not conscious. It's not something they talk about. I'm a Southerner. Most people don't. But certainly they are what they are because of where they're from. And even some of the villains that we have in society and, and the perceptions we have about American society are built on this North-South dichotomy. So one of the things we get when we look at just mentioning history and how bad history has gotten, the first piece we ran for the week is social justice in Clemson University. Clemson University, which, of course, is now in the spotlight because of the national football playoff. We've got that coming up in a few weeks here and a couple of weeks, and uh, we'll have Clemson and Alabama. By the way, when you look at that playoff uh, scenario, uh, there's only one non-Southern school in those top four. You've got Oklahoma, Clemson, and, and Alabama, all Southern schools, and then you've got Notre Dame. Uh, and Notre Dame has its own culture, um, but um, you know, this is an interesting part of college athletics and how important uh, the South is to all of that. But Clemson University, of course, founded by uh, the uh, John C. Calhoun's son-in-law, Thomas Clemson, uh, and in the 1870s. And it is a great university. I'm, I'm, I went to South Carolina, so there are arch rival in football, but it is a great university. They've got uh, great programs there, particularly as an engineering school. This is a, it is a it is a very good school, and at the center of the university is John C. Calhoun's house, and there are other historic properties on on the campus. And the curator, director of curator, uh, director and curator of historic properties at Clemson, is a guy named Will. Uh, I guess it's Hoyt. I think is how you say his name, but. In one of the recent meetings for the Clemson University History, uh, uh, for this uh, pr uh, uh, historic properties meeting, they called HPAC. It's a committee that deals with this. Um, the director, uh, 
handed out a thinly disguised political paper written by a Clemson University history professor named Rhonda Robinson Thomas. And Rhonda Robinson Thomas decided that she was going to write an essay on the history of Clemson University, and it was all going to be about race and slavery and white supremacy and all these, these, these catchphrases and, so, and, and how evil Clemson actually is. Well, the question is, why would you do that? Well, clearly the agenda is to get Clemson University renamed, to think, to recontextualize what this university, the origins of this university. And the author of this piece, Andrew Calhoun, takes her to task in a way that uh, point by point, very sober, saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And this is a man who's descendant from the Calhouns. What you are doing in, by writing a piece like this, and, and Calhoun says, look, nobody ever denied what our family was. Nobody ever did that. But you're trying to make us feel bad about who our family was, and that is immoral. When you look at some of the speeches that were made at unveiling of Confederate monuments, um, Northerners mention this. Anyone who will spit on their ancestors is not really worth their salt. They are immoral people. They are people who should not be respected. And, and Southerners who do that on a regular basis uh, are a major problem. Uh, in in society because they don't recognize who they are they don't remember who they are and so a lot of that has to do with education what what mcdonald talked about and historians not being able to teach anything of course the idea now is indoctrination not education you have uh, um, students on campus who are not really taught to think they're just taught to absorb and anything that is considered to be a little bit controversial, you've got to have trigger no, trigger warnings and safe spaces and all these things and coloring rooms and, and uh, shouting rooms and all kinds of stuff for these students. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Uh, we're running a daycare now at universities. You should be exposed to the ideas that you don't agree with. Uh, you should be exposed to things that you might find uncomfortable and of all, all views. Uh, and that will help you gain a better appreciation for what you do believe in but also to disparage the, the individuals, the philanthropic individuals who founded Clemson University because of, their, because of who they are. This is, a, this is a simple logic 101 fallacy of attacking the person. It, it has nothing to do with the, the, what these people did. They're just bad because of what they had, which, of course, were slave owners, and because they held views which are not in lockstep with 21st century America. Well, it'll be hard to find anyone in American history except for the last maybe 30 years where you're going to find that, 40 years. Uh, so the, the, the agenda, what is the agenda? Oftentimes, and of course, Thomas says in her book, uh, her little piece, I should say, not her book, but her little journal article, that the agenda of the UDC, for example, was to rewrite history. There was an agenda there, an agenda. It's a political agenda. Well, what's the political agenda of Dr. Thomas? What is her political agenda? No one ever asked that question. Well, you're saying these people have a political agenda. What's your political agenda? They would say, well, they don't have one. Well, this is what the UDC would say, too. They don't have an agenda. They're just telling the story. They're just telling history. And Thomas would say, well, you're making it up. Well, I think the UDC could say she's making it up, or at least doing it in a way that has an agenda. It's an agenda-driven piece. That's why people are running away from history. It's why people didn't run away from Forrest MacDonald, but they would run away from Dr. Thomas. They didn't run from Dr. McDonald, but they'd run from Dr. Thomas. And no one really pay attention to her because everyone sees what it is. It's a political piece. The agenda is to advance a social narrative, a social political narrative. That's the agenda. And that's not history. That's an agenda. Uh, so when you... When you understand that, and nobody ever gives it back to them the way they should, well, what's your agenda? Why are you writing this piece? Do you have a, I mean, where are your political leanings? Uh, who do you support? Uh, why, do you, why do you think your history is somehow subjective, but uh, every, or somehow objective, but everyone else's is, is subjective? Why do you think that? Uh, and if your agenda is exposed, I mean, I think if Americans realize the agenda if we expose the agenda on a regular basis, Americans would, and I think a lot of them do, they turn away from history because they don't like it. They don't want to be told everybody that they're ever descended from is a bad guy, particularly in the South. You're talking about people, three-quarters of the white Southern male population fought in that war in 1861 to 65. And so you've got millions of Confederate descendants uh, running around out there. 
Uh, you've got millions of people with Confederate ancestors. You're asking them to spit on their ancestors. And why would you, why would you want them to do that? Well, because that satisfies an agenda. And so uh, this is why you get history like this. Uh, why would you want to have this race, class, gender history? Because it satisfies an agenda of tearing down anything traditional in society. That's why you do it. Because you expose those things as supposedly evil, and then you can tear them down and replace them with your own political, social, and economic agenda. It's all about idealism. It's all about power. Uh, Orwell had it right, but this is exactly what's going on. This is exactly why this piece is so fundamentally interesting and important in, un, in understanding where we are in the 21st century, this Thomas piece. And I think Calhoun does a good job taking it apart, and you should go out there and read it. Uh, but that said, then you've got a couple of other interesting things. Uh, the piece on Wednesday by Michael Martin, Black Southerners in American Wars. Well, nobody ever talks about the number of black Southerners that fought the, in the American Revolution. He uses the painting, uh, The Battle of Calpins, by William Rainey, uh, that depicts uh, a, a young black servant defending William Washington. Now, William, the Washington Light Infantry Building in Charleston, South Carolina, beautiful building, but William Washington is being saved by this uh, African-American, this servant, uh, who's shooting this British officer. As Martin points out, the National Park Service documented at least 15 black men that fought for the Americans at the Battle of Cowpens in South Carolina. Uh, and this this goes on and on. Uh, the War of 1812, you had black you had uh, black Southerners fighting in that particular war, particularly at the Battle of New Orleans. The war between the states. Now, of course, this is the controversial because well, there's no black Confederate soldiers. Depends on how you define a soldier. Depends on what you define as participating. You could make the case that 90,000 black Southerners participated in the war effort. And that was just to help the army. It doesn't include all the people that were on the home front who didn't rebel, who were still producing foodstuffs and and uh, materials for the war and uh, items that were needed to fight the war. Uh, and so you had that. But you also had uh, black Southerners as teamsters, cooks, body servants, all kinds of things, musicians. Uh, are those people, now? nowadays we call them soldiers. Uh, they, these, these men certainly weren't mustered into the army as regular soldiers, and the Confederacy said they didn't exist, that there were no soldiers. I, I agree with that. This is what the Confederacy said. But after the war, they were they were recognized for their service. Uh, you had people like Horace King who didn't support the Confederacy, but who gave a tremendous amount of lumber to it, who built the CSS Jackson, provided the lumber for that. Um, he was a Unionist. He was a former slave, but yet he was still involved in the war effort. So you had a lot of people in this this, um, and then you had other people who actually were you know free people of color that served in the Confederate. Uh, Confederate cause. And we've to Earl Iams uh, talked about that at one of our summer schools. And, uh, you know, the, the the mainstream historians say this is all bunk. Uh, we're just hacks for saying these things. No, I mean, this is, you, you're denying something that exists. Why would you do that? Because of an agenda. Because if you can say that, I mean, this is all just a myth of the quote unquote neo Confederates. Now, they're just doing it to uh, to get people to believe that they're all egalitarians. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's saying that these Southerners weren't racist. Yeah, they were. So were Northerners, by the way. Uh, so so what? I mean, this goes without question in the 19th century. That's not our job. This We're, we're pointing out these things happened. Uh, the fact that the, the real Siamese twins, their sons, fought for the Confederacy. You had, of course, American Indian tribes that fought for the Confederacy. You had Jewish Confederates. You had black Confederates. Uh, so you had all kinds of people that in the South that were supporting the Confederacy for a variety of reasons. Some of it was just out of obligation. Some of it was out of uh, for cause. Some of it was out of for, for comrades. Whatever the case may be, you had these people doing it, and you're denying their history by saying these people did not exist or that you're disparaging their position in that war. You're denying their history. That's ahistorical. And then, of course, Michael Martin points out the Spanish-American War, where you had a large number of Southern blacks as well serving in the Spanish-American War. So this is a really interesting piece. And he's saying that, you know, the truth is more complex than people know. And one of the things he does say at the end is that, you know, if there ever is to be people embracing Southern culture again, you have to embrace for everything that it is. Uh, it's not monolithic. Uh, there are There is a diversity in the South. And this is why the North hated the South. I mean, it's one of the reasons why the North... 
uh, they would call the South all kinds of names, the mulatto democracy and all these things, because they recognized the, uh, the diversity that was in the South that they didn't have in the North. So that was part of it. And then on Thursday, we ran a piece on shoeless Joe Jackson. And this piece is, maybe seems a little out of place. Uh, it's about Southern culture. It's about this great baseball player, Shoeless Joe, which, of course, was made famous in the movie Field of Dreams. Um, but Shoeless Joe was a Southerner to the core. And one of the things you get from the Shoeless Joe controversy, of course, he was banned from baseball for betting and on, on and the Chicago Black Sox. He played for the Chicago White Sox. And they threw the World Series. But there was never any evidence that Shoeless Joe had anything to do with it. He played the game hard in the World Series. He took money. But the thing was, the perception is he really didn't know what he was doing. Uh, he was duped into it. Here's a, here's a country boy, a farm boy from North Carolina, who probably didn't, I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't even write. He signed his name with an X. He was functionally illiterate. And this guy is... A, and, he took the money, but he played well in the World Series. He didn't throw anything. Didn't throw the series, but the other men that were aligned with him did throw the series. And so, uh, but you have this perception of, again, of Southerners uh, and, and poverty. You know, one of the things the Kennedy brothers and, of course, Philip Lee have done a nice job with in Reconstruction is pointing out how poor the South actually was and limited access to education and other things. And this is the case, and this is why Shoeless Joe uh, did not have the understanding to know, I think, what was going on to him. Uh, but uh, certainly this story is one of, you know, it's made pop, cu pop culture in the 1980s with Field of Dreams, and, which was 1989, I think, when that film came out. And uh, so it became, you know, quite, quite the sensation again. But Shoeless Joe Jackson, one of the greatest players, we, we did a piece on Ty Cobb and the, mis and the misconceptions about Ty Cobb, again, also with Joe Jackson, and that uh, he was some kind of cheater. He really wasn't. He really wasn't. And Ty Cobb wasn't the guy, the monster that uh, the press makes him out to be. Again, this is the northern press creating essentially lies out of these southerners, Joe Jackson and Ty Cobb. So this is a wonderful piece. And then finally we have on Friday, American Music is Southern Music, a piece by Tom Daniel. Tom Daniel gave two fantastic talks at our uh, most recent summer school. Those are now, those lectures are available online. Uh, you go to our web page, and under the Lectures tab, you've got all these lectures available to listen to. And uh, we also have them on the app. But Tom Daniels' talk was fantastic, and this piece mirrors that. He actually uses some of the same language. But he points out that just about every musical genre you can think of came out of the South. The South dominated uh, this part of American culture, and still does. Still does. And so um, we forget that. We forget how important the South is there, and Southerners are conscious of this. They're they're conscious of how important Southern uh, the Southern tradition is to music, uh, and how important it is to the fabric of American culture. There's no victimhood here. One of the things you can say about the South is the South is the only uh, section in America that's ever been defeated. I mean, you can say that Vietnam was a defeat, for example, but the United States won the war militarily. We just withdrew. And so I think you're going to see the same thing happening in Afghanistan and Iraq. The United States wins the war militarily but withdraws. That's sort of a loss. But when you look at it as a whole, the South is the only section of the United States that was thoroughly defeated and reconstructed and told it had to be something else. And that creates a certain perception of life. And, of course, it also created tremendous and abject poverty in the South, uh, which was hard to overcome. And so music was a way out for, for that. And it was a mosaic. You had people uh, who were of all races and backgrounds who loved music. Uh, for example, Ray Charles wanted to be a country singer. but He wasn't allowed. Not because the Southerners wouldn't let him, but because Northern businessmen wouldn't let him. So this is the interesting part of the American social and cultural experience how important the South is to the fabric of America, to our military history, to our uh, artistic history, literature, and uh, music, uh, to our visual arts, painting and filmmaking. We're going to run a piece about uh, D.W. Griffith and how he's uh, really a pioneer in modern filmmaking. But, of course, because of his film Birth of a Nation, the guy is just panned everywhere. But his film, uh, outside the, of the content, I mean, you, we can criticize the content, but outside of that, his film was a beautiful piece of, of cinema. And so 
It should be watch for that alone. Southerners are important. They are integral to the the dynamics of American society. Uh, As Tom Daniel points out, as Michael Martin points out, uh, you know, so this is this is essential for understanding where America is and what Americans are for understanding the South. And uh, if we don't do that, if we don't explore what's true, valuable, true and valuable in that Southern tradition, we do so at our peril. Um, so uh, study history, love history, love it for what it is. If you're a historian, write history that people can read. Get people engaged. Your job, whether you're an amateur or professional, is to engage people in history get people thinking about things, that would go a long way to helping save the Southern tradition and help us explore explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Until next time, good day. Good day.